Hey world, Dan Brown here with another episode of Wombo Store. <laughs> ha, yeah, it's a show about Commander. That's why it says that in lower right hand corner. It is not only a show about Commander, it's the craziest show about the craziest format of Magic the Gathering. We call it Elder Dragon Highlander. We call it Commander. We got a lot of names. I'm wearing a witch's hat because it's a magical show and witches are magical. We're going to cast spells and we're going to talk about it. You may also be asking, does Dan Brown change clothes? The answer is no, I don't. Um, got an email. I just watched your Ural, Ural deck tech and really like the content. I have a bottom-up deck that I've been working on that I can send a deck list if you want. I would also like to see where you end up with it as well. Don't know what that means, but we're just going to rock with it. I started building the deck to scratch my combo itch without playing beyond the power level of the players in my play group. I have wanted a deck that incorporated the sum or all of the cards below. Thopter Sword Combo, Mechanized Production, Revel in Riches, approach of the second sun. It's pretty much Esper, I win without using the normal and much easier Laboratory Maniac. If you can come up with a deck that is, quote, I win tribal with more or less colors, I think it would make a combo deck that anyone could play at a more casual table but still get the combo itch. That right there. That right there is the thesis statement. A combo deck that's not quite a combo deck. A lot to unpack. The first uh, cards you mentioned were Thopter Sword, as in Thopter Foundry, and Sword of the Meek. If you've been playing Commander a long time, you've probably run into this at some point. It's not a combo. It's not infinite. But it is very good. Basically, for X mana, you get X 1-1 Thopters with flying and... Yeah, with fly, of course. Thopters fly, of course. I, I had to double check Thopter Foundry to make sure they had flying. It's not like the orchard that makes spirits and those spirits randomly don't fly. I digress. Anyway, you pay X mana, you get X Thopters, and you gain X life. If you have arbitrarily large amounts of mana, that can get out of hand very quickly and create a board that your opponents just can't deal with. If we, you know, want to get into the nuts and bolts of how it literally works, Thopter Foundry, pay one mana, sacrifice your Sword of the Meek. You create a one-one blue Thopter and gain one life. Then when that Thopter comes into play, because you already sacked the Sword of the Meek as part of the cost of this ability. It's before the colon there, right? It's going to trigger from the graveyard whenever a 1-1 comes into play. You can return this from the graveyard into play attached to that creature. Put it on there. Do it all over again. X mana, X life, X 1-1 Thopters. Pretty decent. Um, I am not... Running that in this deck is just not the direction I chose to go after your creative. Uh, I, I, I want to go with something that is truly I win. I want it to say you win the game when certain conditions are met so that it feels as much like a combo deck as possible without technically being a combo deck. So we can thread the needle of technically playing a game where fun is the main purpose, but in reality... Uh, deep down, secretly between you and me, we're just we're still just trying to crush the souls of our friends and demonstrate our dominance, at least on on the the in the planes of the Magic the Gathering universe. So, <laughs> uh, uh, the three options that you gave me here were mechanized production, revel and riches, and approach of the second sun. Um, all three of these are legal and standard right now, which is kind of weird. I think approach of the second sun is probably the only one that's seeing play in standard. But again, I'm not an authority on any format other than Commander, and whether or not I'm authority here is a highly contentious debate topic over on R slash C E D H. But a lot of things are contentious over there. Anyway, I don't mean to throw shade. The uh, ones that I went up, wound up going with here were Mechanized Production and Revel in Riches, um, just because they synergize with each other very well, right? They're basically trying to win the game in the same way during your upkeep if you either have eight artifacts with the same name or... 10 treasures, which in this case, it's kind of tomato, tomato. It's two different ways of saying treasure. We're, we're only going to win with copies of treasures unless some opponent has dinked with our board in some way that gives us eight of some artifact, which seems kind of unlikely to me, but could happen, I guess. Uh, yeah, I just like, they're just, if one gets permanently exiled, we know that we have the other in the deck. These are the only real win conditions I'm going to run in the deck, but, you know, they, they work well, one in lieu of the other. The biggest drawback is if you, like, draw them both, uh, and then one of them is basically just a dead card. Although even then, it's not totally dead, because if the one you cast first gets dealt with, blah, blah, blah. You all play magic. You know how that works. Our commander uh, is going to be Aminatu, the Fate Shifter. Uh, I've, I I just I love this card. I love a lot about this card. Esper has been hard-pressed for interesting good stuff commanders, even though it's in, like, perfect good stuff 
colors. Um, Aloro is normally the default go-to option until now because Aminatu exists. It's just nice to see a good good stuff option in these colors at three CMC. And those three obviously are just the three colors, white, blue, black. Um, and she's also good. Like the, her abilities are, are strong. Um, draw a card and put a card from your hand to type your library and you blink out another permanent. Like if nothing else, you can just use the plus one as like a pseudo scry. And then the minus one um, is a little bit build around, but we have built around it. Um, there's a Baleful Strix in this deck, among other things. I, I, I am having a hard time thinking of any Aminatu build that wouldn't also want to run a Baleful Strix. Unless you're like some all-in CEDH doomsday kind of deck that like even Baleful Strix is just too divergent from the game plan. But any any anything less than CEDH, you're going to want Aminatu have a baleful strix we're gonna call this deck aminatu's treasures Tre treasure aminatu's treasure treasures treasure i mean treasure is plural treasures is also pl I, 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 I let's just move on uh, <laughs> uh so there are gonna be five extra turn effects temporal mastery is just natural in aminatu because she has that top deck manipulation going on um i also if you watched episode one of wombo storm you also know that any deck that runs vampiric tutor and mystical tutor might as well also run a temporal mastery that applies here we're running those tutors i'll get to that in a second but um moreover beyond just taking an extra turn for the bargain basement price of one generic and one blue. Uh, even more expensive mana-wise uh, extra turn effects are worth running here. And the whole idea here, I'm running five of them. Let me backtrack for a second. The whole idea is the ways that we win, if you don't take an extra turn, they're just sitting on the battlefield for an entire turn cycle with your opponents knowing full well what they're about to do during your upkeep. That gives your opponents a lot of time to talk amongst themselves, to pool their resources and figure out how they might stop you from winning the game on your upkeep. So if you take an extra turn, you deny your opponents the opportunity to do that. That's the idea here. We're running five, not a huge amount, but um, usual, usually necessary. I would usually recommend trying to do it that way. Then we have seven what I call treasure makers. Just there aren't that many things in Magic that make treasures. So we're running a lot of them. A lot of these cards would be suboptimal in other builds. Uh, but, I mean, they're, they're they're perfectly playable. A Pirate's Prize is a pretty good example. Four mana to draw two cards. Not the best ratio in the world, but it poops out a little treasure, which could be the difference between nine treasures and ten treasures, or seven treasures and eight treasures, depending on which win condition we have. Uh, Prying Blade is actually fairly decent because, you know, Aminatsu is our commander, which means we are incentivized to run kind of evasive blockers, right? Baleful Strix type cards, which means we'll have lots of options of creatures to um, equip a Prying Blade to and start pooping out treasures turn after turn. Um, spell Swindle is one of the few ways we have to make like a lot of treasures in one fell swoop. If your opponents cast a you know seven, eight, nine CMC spell, Spell Swindle can you know, immediately get you to territory where you have enough treasures to just win the game off of one of your win the game enchantments. But um, probably our primary treasure maker or treasure maker in chief is our prosperous pirates. Is it a plural? Is it a singular? You never know. It is one copy of a creature whose name is a plural. I cast one pirates is grammatically correct. Anyway, uh, when they enter the battlefield, you make two treasures. I mean, it's as simple as that. Five drop, not the most efficiently costed thing in the world. Although, like, in a vacuum, in, like, limited... Uh, if you're making two treasures after casting a five drop, you have only lost three mana on the turn, even though you can't really get there until turn five, blah, blah, blah. But in this deck, that logic doesn't apply as much. You just want them out, and then Aminatu wants to blink them. And then you also want, drumroll please, a lot of ways to copy the Prosperous Pirates. We have nine copiers. Uh, this is kind of, a, th this is a representative sample of the nine stolen identity. Um, we can cipher that onto one of Aminatu's like cheap, efficiently costed blockers, which we'll get to in a second. Helm of the Host is just really, really strong. If you have like a clone, like Phyrexian Metamorph out and Helm of the Host, if you clone your Prosperous Pirates and then equip Helm of the Host to the other one, you can every turn poop out a copy with Helm of the Host, blink the other one without unequipping because this is equipped to whichever one you're not blinking right and then get just a lot of treasures per turn that's like four treasures per turn doesn't take very long to get to that critical mass where you can just win the game off of your enchantment so lots of way to copy and i also like these copiers because in the abstract even without treasures 
they are all good. You know, you can copy an opponent's creature with Phyrexian Metamorph. You can uh, put a token that's a copy of Baleful Strix in with Stolen Identity. You can poop out copies of Baleful Strix with Helm of the Host to continue drawing cards. There's, there are other ways that they can be good other than, um, you know, trying to win the game by making a lot of treasures. Uh, then we have eight tutors. Nothing that exciting here. Just normal standard issue tutors to help us get the pieces we need. Um, 16 draw effects. That is a large number of draw effects, and this is a representative sample. Uh, we're, we're flying really, we're hugging the ground really close in terms of mana cost on these draw effects. We want to just be like paying one mana to look at the top two or three cards, to draw one card, and describe some things away. If we're paying three mana, we either want to be drawn three cards with painful truths or untapping that land with frantic search. We're just drawn, 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 looking for a tutor to get a combo piece that we're missing. You know, it, we're, we're casting a lot of these. Lots of instants and sorceries flying by. You know, I don't... I, I don't know what I was really doing with that sound effect, but let's see. We're just going just gonna to move on. Uh, we also... <laughs> <laughs> we also have cantrip blocker. I've been talking about these a lot. It's kind of a, what do you call it? Like a, it's, it's a hermeneutic circle. There's no way to understand the uh, entire deck until you understand every component part of the deck. So I reference things that I haven't even gotten to yet because I just kind of have to. Anyway, anyway, it's a, it's a quirk of the trade. <laughs> we are on eight. Uh, cantrip blockers baleful strix is the uh, quintessential example i also i love sky scanner brand new card m19 one one flyer for three that draws you a card when it enters it's so good it's probably one of my top 10 favorite edh cards uh it, it, it not that fancy like not fancy at all very simple but so good oh it replaces itself it has evasion it can go in any deck because it's an artifact mm, i love sky scanner uh we have eight things like these uh good blockers for aminatu we can blink them in and out to draw extra cards um five control effects not huge we are kind of close to all in combo and we consider these like you know kind of emergency buttons you know we can we can press the reset button in an emergency if an opponent is getting to their combo before we're getting to ours. Um, I like Nevenrol's Nevenrol's disc here uh, because it doesn't blow up planeswalkers, <laughs> so Amanatu can hang out and uh, maybe. I mean, I don't know that getting her ultimate off is all that good. It, it's nice, you know. The person who controls the nuke always benefits the most from it, so you can decide whether passing left or right all your permanents like affects you in an advantageous way but i mean if nothing else we're just using her plus plus and minus abilities extra times because she didn't die to the board wipe uh anyway we run some board wipes uh and the only acceleration we run in the deck at all is soul ring uh this was kind of an 11th hour change I, the first draft of this deck i ran a normal amount of like ramp and acceleration and it just played very similarly to a lot of like control decks I've built. Uh, it didn't feel like a combo deck. So I, I t took a step back. I was like, what, what's a big change I can make? And I decided to cut most of the high end of the curve and also all of my ramp to make room for more cantrippy little blockers and more cheap like draw effects so that the deck we're not accelerating but we are just like playing lots of like cheap spells building a board like I, I don't think that we're really um hampered too much by not running a lot of ramp in this particular deck i mean we're not in green anyway so you know what are we really missing out on if that, it's, uh, we're gonna get to uh the play testing in a second i'm gonna goldfish but uh if you have anything you want to see me build a deck around or talk about relative to magic the gathering in a future episode of wombo storm uh my email address is danbrownuniverse at gmail.com just talk to me talk to me reach out let me know what's on your mind what do you think what sort of deck are you struggling with or have you always thought would be cool or like what's a card that like you've never taken the time to like figure out what a good deck would look like with it but like you know any anything like this the content that you've already seen if you have an idea that might make for another qu quality Content on the unit. This is my email. This address is right here. This is my email address. Let's goldfish. Shuffle, 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 shuffle. We're gonna draw an opening hand that does have enough lands and has some dig and has some tutor potential. So yeah, I think this is perfectly keepable. We'll call this turn one. We will draw another way to draw more cards. Yeah, I guess let's play an island and let's preordain. Let's scry two. Take a look. 
We got a clever impersonator and a godless shrine. I think we're going to put the godless shrine on the bottom of the library and leave the clever impersonator. We'll, just, we'll draw the clever impersonator, basically. Uh, move to turn two. Um, Prearrange to my graveyard. Untap. Draw a council of advisors. I like that. That's really great right now, actually. We definitely need a way um, to blink in and out creatures that also nets us some cards. So um, awkwardly, nothing to really do for two mana this turn. Drop an underground river, and um, we can Vampiric Tutor on the end step before our next turn. Um, open question as to what we should get. We could get like a Temporal Mastery and treat it like a Glorified Explorer, which I don't actually hate. Or, I mean, I don't know, let's just see what's there. We'll cast a Vampiric Tutor, and then a three. So the Temporal Mastery is in there, but what else could we get? What else are we missing, that is to say? Um, well, and we could also just tutor for a tutor that is more of a tutor, like an increasing ambition, right, as a way to get many, many cards, well, not many, but three cards, specific cards, right out of the deck that we might be missing at any given point. Um, but we're not there yet, like, mana-wise. We're going to need to grind some value first. <laughs> and I don't love getting the Temporal Mastery out of the deck because often that is a linchpin card for the turn that we go off. Although looking at my hand again here, we have a lot of pieces um, otherwise. You know, it, it, it's a little weird casting a tutor so early. Often I like to sit back and wait on my tutors until I know the pieces that I'm missing. But, but right here, mm, we still have enough get there that just getting one turn ahead might be good. It's just so hard to pass up the opportunity to just slap that uh, temporal mastery right on top of the deck. But you know what? I'm, you know what I'm gonna do? You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do the smarter thing. Smarter, more conservative is to always go for these prosperous pirates. Okay, prosperous pirates going on top. Vampiric tutor into the graveyard. We're moving on to turn three. Untap. We will draw. Hey, look there they are. And then I guess. Probably get a Marsh Flats out there, crack that, search our library, get some kind of a dualdy dualdy. Uh, we do want the white black, yeah, white black duel, obviously. Wherever that happens to be. Sure, great, works for me. And for tree mana, probably drop the Council of Advisors first so that we immediately have something to blink and defend Amanatu. Uh, so we'll just go draw that card. Swamp, looks good. Turn four, untap, draw, chart a course. Another reason that we're glad that we dropped the Council of Advisors one turn ago. Uh, yeah, we'll drop a Glacial Fortress as our land for turn. And mapping out this turn, I mean, we could just chart a course, but that boxes us out from casting Amanatu. Uh, how important is Amanatu right this second? Um... Not super. It might be good to get her out and just plus her uh, so that we can just build up some loyalty on her and uh, it'll continue filtering through the deck, maybe hit some sort of um, a tutor. And the fact that we have one land in hand means that we can just put that right on top and know that we're going to draw it as our land for next turn. So I don't hate that. I also don't hate chart a course. I'm kind of in a toss-up state of mind between these two plans. I think I do want to get Aminatu out there. Um, one, two, three, we'll drop Aminatu, we will plus Aminatu. Uh, set counters to four, and we will draw a card. <laughs> hey, soul. <laughs> ha! Hard to be mad at that. I wish we had the soul ring. Well, I guess we can't use soul ring to cast Aminatu, so it doesn't really help us on the turn at all. Um, yeah, I'll put the Swamp on top like I was talking about, tap that, get the Soul Ring out there to save one mana on the next turn. And uh, yeah, speaking of that next turn, let's go ahead and take it. Untap, draw, there's that Swamp. Drop this, turn five, we have seven mana. I mean, potentially nine mana if we blink the Soul Ring in and out with Aminatu. Um, but let, let, let's call it seven to be conservative, which is exactly enough to cast a Prosperous Pirates and to chart a course. That seems smart to me. First things first, though. 
Yeah, you all, let's just go ahead. One, two, three, four, five. Prosperous pirates. Treasure, treasure. Uh, we'll go ahead and just use counters instead of spamming my board and overloading cockatrice <laughs> and maybe causing it to crash. Uh, we'll move to combat. Why are we swinging with the 1-1? Hopefully we have an opponent that can't block a 1-1 and kill it. Real easily or doesn't want to. Maybe we'd even do a little bit of politics. We're just like, hey, can I swing at you for one just so that I can get something in a minute? No, I promise I'll, 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 I'll make it worth your time later, even though we're just trying to combo out and not make it worth anyone's time. Uh, that we sat down <laughs> to play a game of Magic the Gathering. Ah, uh, uh, second main phase. Right, the whole point of attacking was so we could chart a course. Draw. Draw. Right of replication. Planes. That is good. And then Aminatu. Uh, yeah, let's... No, let's... Let's... Mm, yeah, let's, let's, let's blink our Prosperous Pirates. Uh, let's remove a counter and get two more of these. Set counters yellow. Up to four right there. Bada bing, bada bing. Turn six. Untap. Draw a darker wastes. I guess we'll play that as our land for turn. Doesn't really matter. Up our soaring up there. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mana from our lands. If we want to tap into our treasures. See, this deck is so, so, so skill testing because, I mean, this is just an example of one way that it's skill testing. How much mana do we have this turn? You know, if we want to be conservative, we have eight soaring plus, what, six lands. But. If you want to get a little more complicated, we could tap into the treasures. That could bump us up to 12 mana. And we could also blink out the Soul Ring with Aminatu, which could bump us up to 14 mana on the turn. But we need to save our treasures, right? That's what makes it so, so hard. Um, yeah, I, I think the first thing we probably want to do is some compulsive research. Let's just figure out what's going on on top of our library. Let's draw three cards. One, two, three. Okay. Ha 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 Yeah, I like that. And let's go ahead and just discard a planes. And th okay, we we should hopefully be able to get there without passing turn. Now that we have two time warp effects in our hand, we have one, two, three, four, five easy mana available. Although Aminatu makes it so that we can. Well, I, mean, I think what we want to do with Aminatu is remove a counter from her and blink out Prosperous Pirates one more time. Go up to six treasures. Okay, we got six right there. And then one, two, three, four, five. I think we just go ahead and cast the Temporal Manipulation, take an extra turn. We will untap, draw, read the bones. Not bad. What we're missing here is like a tutor. We need to tutor into, or draw into, a way to win the game on our upkeep um, off of one of those enchantments that, you know, again, we have not drawn into just yet. But we, we can make two more treasure with Aminatu this turn. Get up to eight. That's the critical mass for one of those enchantments. It's just a question of how do we then draw it. <laughs> and if we start tapping into our treasure reserve, then we don't have the critical mass anymore. Very skill testing. Very skill testing. And so maybe the answer here is we don't even try to go off. Maybe, I mean, it's turn six relatively early. Maybe we just sit back, cast like a right of replication on the Council of Advisors to draw a bunch of cards. Uh, so let me count my mana again. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight easy mana. Eight mana easy. Um, could bump up to nine for a right of replication, tap into the uh, treasure reserve just a little bit. Uh, and that would draw us five cards and get five Council of Advisors, which I don't know I don't know how much that really does for us. Instead, we could Pirate's Prize and Read the Bones, hopefully hitting a tutor and setting us up for a potential win next turn. Uh, I, th I think that seems pretty strong. Uh, let's read the bones first. One, two, three. Read them bones. Scry two. Um, awesome. Okay, okay, so we have another extra turn effect, which maybe affects <laughs> uh, whether or not we try to go off this turn still. Let's move Austere Command to the bottom of our library uh, and go ahead and draw two cards. We'll draw apart the Water Veil as one and then Opt as another. I, I don't hate it, that's fine. Light as air. Um, yeah, let's say. Let's go ahead and drop that Opt. Opt to Opt. 
Try one. Okay, there's a tutor. We're going to leave that right there. We are going to draw that tutor. Seems good to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, what do we do? I, do <laughs> I, I don't remember if I used Aminatu this turn. Just I'm going to be completely honest. I'm going to be conservative and say that I did not. But if you rewind the tape and realize... Or sorry, that I, I'm going to be conservative and say that I did. So that I don't use it twice on accident. That's uh, But if you rewind the tape, uh, you know, the deck is just even better than you're seeing right now. <laughs> if I'm making the mistake that I'm worried I might be making. But, um, yeah, yeah, I think that we're pretty close to there. I'm going to say for 1, 2, 3, 4, we're going to Diabolic Tutor on this turn. FNF3, we're going to search for that mechanized production. Put that into our hand. Uh, and Diabolic Tutor is going to go into our graveyard. And then turn 7. Hopefully, this is early enough and feels enough like a combo deck that we're all satisfied. Um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty straightforward from here. Remove a counter from Aminatu. Make two more treasures by blinking our Prosperous Pirates. Set counters. We do have eight of them. Then for one, two, three, four, we go ahead and drop a Mechanized Production. We're going to enchant w one of our treasures. Uh, attached to cart. Treasure. Great. And then... Oh, this is beautiful. It works out so exactly one two three four and then we will five cast our time warp all right we're gonna take an extra turn after this one we'll go ahead and move that turn untap upkeep mechanized production trigger we're gonna get one more treasure that is eight it's the beginning of our upkeep this, there's a trigger on the stack that says if you control eight or more artifacts with the same name you win the game oh my goodness i think we just won the game look at that didn't that feel like a combo deck it felt like a combo deck, but it's not technically. So none of your opponents, legally now, legally, at least in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I don't know what the laws are in your state, but here, no opponent is allowed to be upset losing to a deck that's not a combo deck, right? Isn't that what we're going for? Isn't, wasn't that the creative here? My name is Dan Brown, and it has been Dan Brown. And it will continue to be Dan Brown. You're, you've watched Wombo Storm. Wombo Storm. Remember, the real game is the meta game. The real win condition is having the most fun. Good luck and have fun. Give your mom a call when you have a chance. She'd love to hear from you. And until the next episode of Wombo Storm, I'm going to be hanging out, playing more magic. All right. Love you.